Dorian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. So thanks for inviting oh. me. Dorian, I'm excited to have another friend of so many other friends that we've had here on the podcast, another world-class retirement quote coach. I know you're good friends with Robert Laura and uh, many of our other guests, and you also have a doctorate in philosophy. So perfect. We get to have some real philosophical conversations today. I look forward to bringing that into our discussion, but I want to kick it off with your website, one revolutionizeretirement.com. And in your bio, one of your promises in your bio is to revolutionize the concept of retirement. The word revolution really stuck with me. And as I thought through the word revolution, I said to myself, you know, revolutions are usually driven by necessity or a perceived necessity, at least. What makes this revolution a necessity in your mind? I think that's a sort of good question. And I think a number of things. I think the reality is that the concept of retirement was conceived actually in Germany, but way back in the 1930s, when people lived shorter lives, a lot of people, you know, had more industrial jobs and they were on their feet and they were really burned out by the, you know, retirement age of 62 or 65. Life's changed now in the 21st century. People are living longer. We're in the midst of what's called the longevity revolution. So by the time you're the 62 or 65 age, the likelihood is now with medical advances that people are going to live another 20, 30, maybe even 40 years. So we need to totally turn retirement on its head and revolutionize it. Many people don't even think we should use the term anymore. And, you know, there's a lot, the jury's still out about that, but some people like to think about it as revolutionize it, rewiring, refinement, attunement, you know, all the R words. <laughs> because it used to be that people would retire. And then it was the idea that, you know, within six to 10 years, they died. Now, as I said, we live longer. So I think it, there is a necessity. There's a necessity to change the paradigm of aging. You know, it's not all downhill after 60. People used to think it was. Now there's this vast plateau, you know, these bonus years that we have with a lot of hills and valleys. But there's these wonderful opportunities and challenges because no matter how well we take care of ourselves, we all do age. But, you know, there's opportunities for new beginnings. And even with chronic illnesses or terminal illnesses, I mean, attitude can really impact how we live our life. And there's no reason not to be active and vital and have a sense of purpose throughout our entire life. You know, Dorian, revolutions take time. They don't happen they overnight. Do. They do. We won't see the end of this revolution, maybe until the end of the current retirees' lifetimes. Maybe it's 20, 30 years from now. If you look ahead 20, 30 years from now, what do you hope uh, becomes a thing of the past when it comes to retirement? Is there one thing mm -hmm. specifically that you would like to see become ridiculous 20, 25 years from now? Well, already most industries don't have a formal retirement age, so there's an option. I think in 20 years, I'd like to really see that the term retirement isn't there and that people will have rethought the world of work and will think about you know, the different ways that one can work, different stages and ages in life, and that people can work full-time, people can work part-time, People can be consultants. We may see many more entrepreneurs. Um, I think the work world of work is going to keep changing. I think with the pandemic, <clears throat> we've seen more remote work. Um, I think in 20 years, the world of work is going to be really different. We're going to have more AI. Um, so my hope is that there'll be more notions about intergenerational workplaces and it may be a combination of remote and in-person. And my hope is that ageism will have uh, been turned on its head, that there'll be a revolution of, of ageism and internalized ageism, because a lot of times people really internalize those myths about being old and over the hill. So my hope in 20 years is that we now have become good role models 
and younger people aren't as afraid of aging. And the world of work really allows people of different ages to work with and learn from and with each other. So I guess that's sort of my vision of how it will be. Um, and that the younger generation will, you know, really have turned retirement on its head. And, um, you know, maybe people, because we're living longer, will discover that they can take time off in between, you know, when they're more able to do a lot of things and then come back to work, you know, when they're older. And that older people are really valued for the wisdom and perspective, you know, that they have and the resilience and flexibility. So, you know, I'd love to see all that happen in the next 20 years. And that's what you feel we really get wrong about retirement is this concept that we get to 60, 65, and we just can't work anymore. We're not adding any more value. And that's what it sounds to me like you'd like to see become a thing of the past. And we see those individuals that are of current retirement age as even more valuable and leveraging those talents in different ways. And I want to see employers recognizing that. So employers are valuing older workers and are really able to recognize that there's historical wisdom you know, and that older workers have a lot to share and give and also to learn. Um, but so it's, it's, it's both the workers themselves as well as employers that need to be educated about what's possible. Well, and you've, I, I feel like you've titled these retirement years as your bonus years. Your TED Talk was titled embracing your bonus years, but I'd like to hear it from you. How do you define bonus years and why the term bonus years? Well, people use different terms for it. Some people just say the third age. Um, some people say second half of life. I like the idea of bonus years, which will probably change in time because it will be just sort of what is. Now it's new. You know, it's the paradigm shift that you know, people are living longer. And that if, as I said before, if you reach the age of 62 or 65, the more kind of traditional retirement age, the likelihood is, the expectation now is that you're going to live probably into your, you know, 80s and 90s. In my parents' generation, that was the exception. Now it's the expectation. And um, there's a, there's a, a statistic that I always like to share, so I'd like to share it with your listeners, that there's some research that says by the time we're 65, it's 30% genetics, and that's real. If there's some genetic issues you have, but 30% genetics, 70% are things we can have some control of, like nutrition, like exercising our body and brain, like spirituality, like meaningful relationships, being part of community. Uh, connection, engagement, and purpose and meaning. These are all things we can have control of. So, you know, my hope for people is, and, and that's part of why I like to think about it as bonus years, it's really an exciting time. Um, and we didn't have that in my parents' generation. We have that now. And it really just may be a given, you know, as um, our kids um, or our kids' kids also grow up, that it won't be the bonus years anymore. It will be just a given. But right now, I still think about it as the bonus years. And so I focus in my TEDx talk on embracing those years as a time to grow, learn, and explore. You know, again, with that notion, it's not all downhill, because that's what people used to think. You know, people used to sort of think it was like this expired, you know, kind of date on our forehead, and we were just waiting to die. It's not that way. I mean, it could be that way if you have a negative attitude, um, but it doesn't have to be that way. There's actually a study out of Yale, Becca Levy, who's a psychologist there, that a positive attitude about aging can actually give you seven and a half more years of life. So it's really important to think about. So they, they are exciting. They're bonus years at times to learn, grow, and evolve. Is that an evolution? And maybe you don't have the answer. Maybe you don't know the statistic, but I am curious, how does that control evolve throughout our lifetime from the time that we're born until the time we're, say, 65, as this study has shown, that we have 30% genes and we have 70% control over our future and our life and, and just our overall well-being? 
Do we have more control when we get to be 65? <laughs> Do we have less control? Is, is there an evolution that's yeah. occurring there? That's an interesting question. You know, I don't really know the answer to that, but my attitude is just on my kind of intuitive sense is if from the get-go, um, we empower our children through education and good nutrition and learning and, you know, to control the parts they can throughout life, then, you know, people have more and more control. I think that um, I, I don't really know for sure why the age 65 was picked for this study, but it probably was based on the more traditional retirement ages. And it was, you know, my, my sense is probably it was focusing on, you know, these bonus years that we have to, to really help people recognize that it's not all a given, you know, in terms of our genetics, but there's a lot we can do. But I am a believer that the earlier we start controlling the parts that we can control, the better. I mean, certainly we can't control everything in life. We never, you know, we, we never could and we never will. Um, so the sooner you start trying to control the parts you can, I think the better off you'll be. I think that can be really encouraging for some that mm -hmm. get to this point in life. And I think this is why that study was conducted. This is why you like to focus on this is this feeling for some that, well, now we don't have control anymore. I, I'm too old to start a new career. I, I can't right. get myself back in shape. My family's in ruins. Right. How am I going to pick up the pieces and pull the family back together? But you still have so much control. 70% is still in your control when you get right. to that point. And it might not arguably even be more than that you know, at that point uh, in certain aspects of life. Uh, you had shared during that talk an interesting view on life transitions uh, as far as, could you just share your view on life transitions mm -hmm. and how that specifically relates to retirement? Sure. Well, you know, if you think about it, all of life is, is transitions. You know, that, you know, we transition when we're born. <laughs> we transition when we go to school. We transition when we get a job, when we get married, if we get divorced, if the spouse dies. And retirement is also a transition. And I find it a really helpful concept to think about because all transitions have an ending, a period of unknown, and a new beginning. And what I find really helpful is I like to ask people to think about the transitions in their past. Do you tend to have more trouble with the ending of things, with the unknown, with the new beginning, with none of it, with all of it? Because it can help you think about how you're going to approach retirement. And I, you know, retirement no longer is a destination. You know, now that we're living longer, it's, it's just the beginning of a journey. So I, I like to think about, and I think many, many people are now thinking about retirement as a transition. So I think if one thinks about it that way, you can inform yourself with how you've helped, you know, dealt with transitions in the past. And that may help you know, you know, is it going to be harder for you, you know, when your full-time job ends? Um, is it harder for you when you haven't quite decided what are you retiring to? you know, and what's next in your life? Or is it harder for you to just start something new? Um, and, and it may not be hard for any of it. It may be hard for all of it, but I, but I think it's helpful. But I also do think it's helpful to think about re these retirement years as a transition. Many people want to retire from their full-time work, but they want to still work and they want to use their skills, but maybe in a different way. Maybe in the same industry that they're in, maybe as a consultant, maybe as a mentor, you know, maybe just part-time. You know, so there's some people who want to phase retirement. Some people want to stop their full-time work. Maybe they really are burned out and tired, but they know there's just more fire in their belly and they want to do something different. And maybe they want to do something in the not-for-profit world, or maybe if they've been in the not-for-profit not-for-profit world, they want to become an entrepreneur and start their own business. Um, or maybe they want to do volunteer work, you know, where they have, they're, you know, being able to contribute to something that's just really important, you know. And maybe they want to spend time with children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, um, or, you know, any age people, just maybe in intergenerational connection. There's really no right way. 
And I think more and more people are focusing on the excitement of this transition year and to think about retirement not as a destination, but a transition and to think not so much about what you're retiring from, but what you're retiring to. How do you want to live the rest of your life? In your experience, well, in your research, in addition to your experience working with so many that are undergoing this transition, is there a typical timeline that you have uncovered in this work to find that this is the beginning? This is, well, this is the end, right? So it's the end, which means it's the end of this old life, this maybe work life that I had prior. Then there's this unknown period, and then there's a new beginning. Uh, is there a timeline that you have kind of uncovered for the average retiree on how long each one of those periods last and, and when they, maybe what the, the most difficult part is? You know, it really does vary from person to person. Um, and I, and I, I really mean what I say that there's no right way. Um, you know, if somebody's really burned out, uh, there may be what's sometimes thought of as the kind of the honeymoon phase. You know, where people just really don't want to do much of anything. You know, maybe they want to travel. Now, the pandemic has made that more complicated, but I think that, you know, is beginning potentially to open up again. But, you know, people may want to, you know, sleep in or play golf or go sailing or, you know, spend time with children and grandchildren. What I found in my clinical work, in my coaching work and therapy work, is that generally after about a year or two, could be sooner, could be longer. If people haven't yet been able to figure out what's, gonna, what's giving them connection, engagement, and purpose and meaning, then often I find that, you know, I'll meet them, they'll come in for some either therapy, help, or coaching, trying to figure out what's missing. And it's, it's one of the things that I find really important for people. I think it's important while you're still working or, you know, when you stop working to think about what did work provide for you? You know, what was it that were the really beneficial parts of work? And in general, what I find and what people say is it gives them a reason to get out of bed in the morning. If you're in a relationship, it gives you time together and time apart except for the pandemic when everybody was working remotely at home. Um, it gives you self-esteem. It generally gives you a sense of community and camaraderie. And it gives you connection, engagement, and purpose and meaning. And so what I you know, suggest to people is think about if you're not working in the same way, if you're not working full time, how will you build that into your life? How will you build the you know, the basis of well-being into your life, and that's the connection, engagement, and purpose and meaning. And if you haven't built that in, then it can be a slippery slope, and uh, people can get depressed, they can get too isolated. You know, we have a loneliness pandemic. You know, we've seen as people get older, there can be too much drinking, even turning to drugs. Those, that's the dark side of retirement. And so, you know, by thinking ahead, and figuring out how to build this in, I think it's, it's helpful for you. There's actually a, a, a book that came out in July that, that I recommend to your listeners. It's by um, Ken Dykewald and Robert Morse, and I don't know if they've been your guest or not, but it's called What, Are Re what, what Do Retirees Want? And it, I can't remember the exact title at the moment, but it's sort of thinking about life's third age. And what Ken does that I like is he really looks at sort of the stages pre-retirement and then the stages within retirement. And actually through his research, he's got segments of people, some who you know, want to use their skills and want to be contributors, some who you know, kind of want to work in a different way, uh, some who just want to play. They work so hard and they want to play. And you know, some who you know, have to keep working because you know, they haven't been you know, able to take care of their finances and they're not in a good position. And, you know, and whether they really want to or not, they need to keep working. And then they may face some of the ages and being able to either keep working in their industry or, you know, find another job or start their own business. And you probably know more about that with, you know, your background with the financial planning. But 
Uh, there, there, you know, there are so many different types of retirees, and I think it's helpful to sort of recognize what your own unique situation is. But I think for me, a commonality is it's very important to build in connection, engagement, purpose and meaning, meaningful relationships, community, and some intergenerational connections. I think that's all an important part of, you know, of a, of a vital, healthy next stage of life. It seems to me in my experience that humans dislike uncertainty. They don't like the unknown. And in my experience, that unknown period tends to be the most stressful for most as, as I see it, because it's the unknown. It's just not who we are as humans. But for many, they're transitioning out into retirement and they just want out. They just want to retire. They just want to get to that glory land called retirement. And so the end can be very easy and that transition can become so much smoother if we create some certainty to reduce the, the, the timeline or the, the width of that yeah. unknown period. Uh, are there some specific tactics or uh, maybe tools you'll use with those that you work with to increase that certainty and reduce the, the time that that unknown period continues to go on. And I, I guess maybe I'm going to tag one more in there. It, do we have to have the unknown period? I, I feel like in some aspects of life and many transitions, we have to have some unknown in order to discover what we really want when we get to that new beginning. You know, I think about children that go to college, they go, I don't know what I want to do. Well, you have to just start. You have to get going. You have to figure it out along the way. You have to have this unknown period. You know, do we have to have the unknown period? And in your experience, do you find that there's ways that we can decrease the width of that unknown period? Yeah, again, that varies from person to person. You know, what I said before is it really is helpful if people begin to think about what am I retiring to? And for some people, really actively thinking about that, giving yourself permission to know that you want to end something because you want to open up room and space for something else. Um, and you don't want a long unknown in between. And so some people actually start thinking ahead of time and to think about, um, what are my skills? What are my strengths? What skills do I want to hold on to? What ones might I, you know, just as be happy to let go of? Um, and so what do I want to do next? So that there is a plan and that, that can reduce some of that unknown period. Um, other people, just like a transition to college, just say, I know I'm really tired. Um, I don't know what's next. I just need some time, my time, you know, the time to do nothing. And they don't want to actively think about it right then. And so then the uncertainty might be a little bit longer, but they may build in ways to help with the uncertainty, like the travel or like um, taking classes. I mean, I'm a firm advocate of lifelong learning, and there's so many great opportunities to, you know, now there are so many things both online, but, you know, around the country, there are programs, some are called OSHER lifelong learning programs, uh, because they've been, um, money was given by um, Mr. OSHER um, to fund their lifelong learning programs, but most, many, I won't say most, but many universities, you know, have lifelong learning programs or adult education programs in many, many high schools. So that can also be something that people can use in that sort of interim period um, so that it might reduce what they're going to. Um, Bruce Feiler, who's written a lovely book, Life's in the Transition, talks about that um, the period of uncertainty as kind of the messy middle. And some people like the messy middle and other people kind of want to navigate out of it, you know, more quickly. Um, and, and I think one of the ways you're asking about some tools, you know, I think it's helpful for people to think about kind of a, a period of giving themselves permission to decide what's important to them. You know, what might be things I left on the back burner when I was younger that I was interested in, but life got in the way and I never had time, you know. Who are people that maybe I admired and I admire what they've done? What are things that maybe were 
hobbies that I'd like to have more time for? Are there languages I want to learn? Do I want to teach? You know, and these lifelong learning programs can provide opportunities. You know, so there are ways that people can think about you know, how to use that time of uncertainty as they begin to think about what's next. Yeah, and during that period yeah. of uncertainty or no one happened before the end. Right. If we got well, to that, that before the end, and yeah. that's what I, I think my mother-in-law has been so inspiring in that way that I've, I've seen her husband pass away. She's approaching retirement and she's doing work. She's going to woodworking classes, trying new volunteer opportunities, spending yeah. more time with her grandkids, a little, time, a little more time off work and, you know, and traveling a little bit. She's getting to experiment in those areas to reduce the uncertainty after the end. And it's, that's a beautiful, beautiful example. And, you know, I encourage people to do that. And I encourage your listeners, if, if you have hobbies, keep doing them. If you don't have hobbies, start thinking about what you'd like to do, because that will help. That will help in that period of time of reducing the uncertainties. The well, other thing, go, no, ahead. go ahead. No, I was going to say the other thing that's often helpful is, you know, if people feel really stuck. I say, think about what are three things that you're really proud of that you accomplished in life? What was it? What made you proud of it? What did you do? Who was with you? You know, it can be three things you're proud of, a three peak experience you've had. You know, again, it can kind of get the ideas going and let yourself brainstorm with each other to think about what would be some fun things to do, learn, you know, during this period while I'm thinking about what's next. I think your, your was it your mother-in-law or mother? Yeah, uh, it was a beautiful example. Just that's a great example. Some people feel stuck though. And um, men and women, I would say it had been men more, but now that women have been also, you know, so much in the workforce, some people have gotten to a point in life where work is their primary identity and they forget about the other parts of their identity you know, like being maybe a husband or a wife or parent or sister or aunt or just person. Um, and so it's helpful to think about who am I separate from my CV? Um, some people elect themselves to do that ahead of time. Others might put off retiring because they're just so frightened. I've seen this among, um, I think more men than women, because I think sometimes women have more hobbies or more kind of outside the group relationships. I mean, I always say women can start up conversations in the restroom lines, of which there are often many of the lines. Um, men often, it's a stereotype, but too often men's um, connections and activities are through work. And so it is really important you know, for those men and women, but you know, a good portion of men to think about developing friendships, you know, men's groups are beginning to develop more too, or it can be through a faith-based, you know, program that you're in, but to think about, you know, who will still be my friends, or can I develop some new interests or new activities, or, or take up something I've never done before, but would like to do. Thinking ahead really helps, and it helps, just as you're saying, it helps reduce the uncertainty. Um, it helps you just feel more empowered. Um, during this time of transition. You know, in that TED Talk, you talk about the difference between um, old and complete, becoming old and, and becoming complete. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I like the phrase of becoming whole, not just old. And if you think about it, that you know, throughout life, there just, there's so many parts of us kind of that emerge at different stages of life. Um, and... I think as we get older, you know, with life review, with reflection, there is that opportunity to, um, in Saging International, they call it harvesting the wisdom of, of really thinking about the who, I, who am I and to integrate all these different parts of oneself to become more whole. You know, to, I mean, we all have strengths and limitations. We have good things, bad things. We've all made mistakes. Hopefully we've learned from them. But the more we can you know, sort of acknowledge that and, 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 and really appreciate the wisdom and perspective that we have, the resilience we've developed, 
I think it does make us more integrated and more whole. And I think the more whole you feel, and it doesn't mean you're not going to feel old or that you're getting older, but it helps you realize you're still so much part of this world and it's sort of the vital aging, you know, and that you still have a lot to contribute you know, as well as to learn. I mean, I think both parts are, are important. That's that realistic optimism that you speak about. I, I am getting older, but I, I'm getting better. I'm becoming more complete. Exactly. And maybe, you know, as a 70 year old, I can't exercise the way I did when I was 40 or 50, but I can still exercise. You know, or maybe I, you know, need to walk a little bit more slowly. You know, sometimes we have to change our dreams. You know, if you've got bad knees at whatever age, you know, maybe you don't climb up high mountains, you find more flat surfaces or, you know, I mean, sometimes the dreams need to change, but we all still need dreams. Well, when I heard this, uh, getting old and becoming complete, uh, the difference between the two and really changing the way we think about it, becoming whole at this stage in life. You know, ageism works both ways. And I'm at the other end of that spectrum. You know, as a 35 year old, I'm going, well, what can I do? Can I not be complete? You know, what can I do to become whole or become complete? Do I have to wait until I'm older in order to become complete? What would be your guidance or what are your thoughts for the, today's youth um, and millennials, et cetera, that maybe aren't at that stage in life, where they're 60, 70, um, how can they accelerate their completeness or wholeness? Is it possible? And what can they do? Definitely possible. And I think it's tied into the question you asked before about, you know, do we have to wait till we're 65 to control those parts of our lives? Or can we, you know, begin to control them at earlier ages? I think in the same way, I think what I'm finding or hope for among millennials, you know, and, and younger is that people see kind of life stages as just sort of normal part of life and are less afraid of getting old. And if you are less afraid of getting old and you think about at each stage of life, you can become whole. Now, you're going to have more and more life experiences as you go along, but that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, process the wisdom that you, you know, and the perspective, you know, that you develop along the way, you know, and then you're a little bit further ahead of the game, you know, when you kind of reach this next stage. Um, I, I think because the longevity revolution has, you know, happened sort of more recently. I mean, I'm one of what's called the leading edge boomers. I turned 60 when everyone was going, you know, oh my gosh, look at all these boomers, 10,000 a day, you know, they're, you know, they're turning 60 and then 65 and 70. And now, you know, all of the leading edge boomers were all 75 now. Um, so there was a lot of hype about, you know, trying to think about aging in a different way now for those of us that were aging but i think you know we, we are and hopefully you know, can be role models for your generation and younger generations to say don't be afraid of getting older you know these different ages provide different opportunities and just think about what you're learning think about controlling the parts you can you know think about being whole but being open you know to learning new things from older people and from younger people I, I think that that will, I mean, it's tied into your question, too, of what would the world be like in 20 years. It would be wonderful if there were less of these age segments, you know, and we just looked at life stages and health stages. A lot of people are talking now about, let's just look at health stages and life stages, and that, that, that people just accepted this kind of more natural flow in life, um, and that... Um, you know, we, we all have something to offer. A, a dear friend of mine, Jan Hybley, who's now 89, uh, she says, meaningful work, paid or unpaid, through one's last breath. And I love that as a mantra. You know, and, and one can start with that at really early ages. You know, kids can start early volunteering. People can, you know, and, and studies have shown that if, if people have volunteered along the way, there's more of a likelihood that they'll they'll do that as they get older. And there's so many ways to connect with each other, be part of community, and help the world. Our planet certainly needs it. Yeah. 
Well, that's what I really see as our opportunity, you know, in this world and as a firm, you know, that ability yeah. to elevate the impact that the individuals we work with are able to make in this world. Um, and, I, you know, I want to make sure we get to questions and conversations. Uh, our tribe loves a good question. And sure. as a therapist and as a coach, that's one of your talents. Uh, in your bio, one of your promises uh, was to help people not shy away from important conversations. What are some of the most important conversations that you feel we need to be having around aging? Around aging to start with, but I think about um, not being afraid of aging, but I think one really important conversation are end of life issues and wishes. You know, we never know when the end of our life is going to be. I mean, hopefully it's after, you know, a good long, you know, full vital life. Um, but, you know, we certainly know with events that happen, just the events last week with that building collapse or 9-11 or you know, accidents or whatever, you know, life happens. They say life happens when you're busy making plans. So end of life conversations are hard. I always say money, sex, and death are sort of still taboos. They may have eased up a little, but they're hard for people to talk about. I think all of those are important conversations, but I think end of life issues, I think I sound like I'm probably on a soapbox, but I do really are important issues um, to, to talk to your adult children or nieces or nephews or siblings or friends. What's important to you? How do you define quality of life? You know, what heroic measures, if any, do you want? And in what circumstances might you want them? Um, you know, some people really like to think about, you know, designing what their funeral will be like you know, and, and thinking about and planning ahead. Um, what, what I think is important to realize that, you know, when somebody dies, it's, it's a crisis time. Even if somebody's had a wonderful long life, it's still a crisis. And if at the time of crisis, you don't know what, where the accounts are, or who the key people are, or what the passwords are, since so we have digital worlds now, you're compounding the crisis. So in addition to the conversations about what's important to you, it's also important to keep your real life and digital life up to date. So if something happens, if you become incapacitated, somebody knows how to take care of things and you're not putting even more pressure on people at a time of crisis. So I think that's an important thing. I think talking about money is so important. And I mean, I'm sure you do a lot of this. And I think having your podcast is wonderful. You know, money is not, not just a number. Money is a tool, really, when you think about it. It's, it's to help you have the kind of lifestyle options that you want. And I think no matter how much or how little money you have, it's important to have financial planners that you talk with so you know, you know how you want your money to be spent and what amount you need in order to have lifestyle choices. And I think you know, that's throughout life. I, mean, I, I really encourage people early on to you know, have these conversations and to continue to have them. Um, so those are some of them. I think in relationships, there's another set of, um, of conversations to have, and I'm happy to kind of sure. I want to get mention into that too. those conversations yeah. specifically. But first, uh, you mentioned money as a tool. And when I, I, I heard you say that during your, your TED Talk, money as a tool, <laughs> and I thought, well, that's great. Uh, however, but do we view it that way uh, as, you know, many retirees, they've been seeing it as a number on a balance sheet uh, as part right. of their net worth or a scorecard that it's just been this accumulation number they've been working on for 30, 50 years. And now they have to change their way of thinking from it's just a number on a balance sheet to this is a tool. I can spend it. I can enjoy it. I, do you see that with the families that you work with, the individuals you work with, they have difficulty viewing it as a tool? For those that do have a difficulty with that transition, 
how do we start thinking of it more as a tool, something that we can really enjoy and spend? Most people didn't save all that money just so they could leave it behind. Most of them saved it as a tool that they could enjoy, but it's so hard to get over that hump, and I completely understand. Oh, you're absolutely right. And I think it's really important conversations to have, to have, you know, with friends, with your partner, with your adult children, with your financial advisors, with coaches, therapists, you know, if you have them. Um, we all have been primed to the idea of a number. And, and I think it does people a disservice to not think of in, in more of the holistic way in terms of how do you want your money to work for you and what lifestyle options do you really want? I mean, I find these are important conversations that I try to help people have. And, and it's hard sometimes because, you know, you watch these ads on TV, you know, about the number. And, you know, and, and I think they're trying to change some of that, but um, it's hard. You know, it's a, almost a, like yeah. it's been the system has been, been designed. The financial world has been designed to keep you from spending your money. Right. It, because that's how they make their money. Right. They want you to keep it there and keep it growing. They don't want you to spend it. it. It's true. And I think what I find to be hard sometimes with some of my clients that are older is to recognize that it's important to allow themselves to spend it on themselves. You know, for so many, you know, the idea is, well, I've saved it because I want it for my children. You know, and they, they sometimes then don't let themselves do some things that would really give them some joy. Um, and, you know, I, I know it can sound harsh, but I sometimes say to people, you know, maybe there won't be an inheritance for your children. You know, it's important that you take care of your health care needs. It's important that you take care of, you know, being able to make the most of the life you have. And if there's some left, fine. But I think, and I do think these are important conversations to have with adult children. So they're not living their life expecting, well, I'm going to get this inheritance from my parents. And many will, you know, but, and it doesn't have to be an all or none, but you know, those are important things to talk about. And I do think that, you know, it's hard sometimes for older people to talk about, but also to talk about it with the younger generation. So that, you know, because sometimes that can lead to people becoming underachievers because they think, well, I don't have to you know, work so hard because I know I'm going to inherit from my parents. Um, so, so it can be complicated. That's why you have such an important role in people's lives. <laughs> There's so many individuals promoting this today. One of our past <laughs> podcast guests, that Mitch Anthony, you know, he talks oh, about right. yep. making the shift from return on investment to return on life, you know, on the way to retirement, exactly. yes, it's ROI. You get to retirement, it's about ROL, and that can right. be a challenging shift. It can be a challenging uh, shift. So you yeah. brought up money, sex, debt, money, sex, and debt. You know, these are the things that are some of the leading causes of divorce, right? And that's probably why many of the conversations you had in your book are around money, sex, and debt. Uh, the book was a collaboration, uh, a co-authored book uh, titled The Couple's Retirement Puzzle, 10 Must-Have Conversations for Creating an Amazing New Life Together. And we're going to be giving that away here towards the end of our There's conversation. There's a picture of it. <laughs> yeah, there it is. If you check out our YouTube picture, picture um, channel, you'll be able to see a picture. Uh, so The Couple's Retirement Puzzle. Uh, what is it that drove you to write a book like this? Uh, I find that many of us, as we decide to go down the path to write a book, put something out there in the world, uh, usually it wasn't because we had it all figured out. Usually we had some stumbling blocks. We learned some things and we wanted to share that with the world. Uh, well, a few things. Um, initially, we thought we would just do a workbook and then we discovered there was so much to say it became a book. <laughs> but there were some studies coming out from some financial institutions um, that I became aware of, that we became aware of in the, um, you know, the 2000s that basically were saying couples are not talking about retirement. And there were some statistics about people not knowing, you know, um, what money they had saved, uh, not, you know, not really having a sense of what they needed for retirement not talking about what their expectations were for retirement. And that really influenced our decision to focus on couples. And 
although written for couples, what I often say to people is that it's really helpful to think the book can be helpful even if you're not in a relationship, because if there's anybody significant in your life, you know, it can be a partner, it can be, you know, your best friend, it can be adult children. These conversations are important to have with whoever's significant in your life, whoever is going to be part of your life kind of going forward. And through clinical work and through some focus groups, you know, influenced by these financial studies, we, we focused on couples and we came up with these 10 conversations. And over the years, I've added a couple of others. Um, but these were the ones that just came up over and over. And in addition to the money, you know, sex and death, um, there are nuances to it. You know, with people, and I think during the pandemic, people often have said that they sort of experienced what, you know, maybe being home with retirement was kind of like. You know, but it's, it's thinking about time together, time apart. It's having conversations about expectations of each other. It's having conversations about sexuality. You know, some people think, you know, it's all over after age 60, and that's not true. And, but that, you know, our bodies change, sometimes our needs change, sometimes our desires change. And so, but, you know, but sexuality is sensuality, and we're, you know, we're sexual beings, sensual beings from birth onward through death. Uh, so it's an important part of the conversation. Plus, with gray divorce, there are more and more people, you know, who are suddenly out there wanting to date again, you know, or people who are widows or widowers. And so it's important to have conversations. An interesting statistic, I mean, the financial planners don't often talk about this, but an interesting statistic is that there is a um, over the over 60 population has a high incidence of sexually transmitted diseases because people think I don't need to use protection. I can't possibly get pregnant. But you know, people need to be aware and, 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 and know that we're sexual creatures, but you need to have conversations. You need to be careful. You need to take care of yourself. So that's another area. Time together, time apart, relationships and obligations with family. You know, you know, we have long-term marriages, we have families with children, we have families without children, we have solo agers, we have blended families, we have people together and not married. And so, you know, each person in a relationship may have different sense of obligations to family. And that can create some tension if, you know, if it's your kids, my kids, our kids, you know, who are we taking care of? Who are we helping for college? Who do we want to leave money for? Um, where to live? There are many more options now than there used to be, like in the parents' generation, you know, on where to live. And, you know, many, you know, a high percentage of people, I think about 70%, say they want to age in place. Well, if you want to age in place, it's important to think about what do you need to do to make your home accessible if, you know, you're no longer able to climb stairs or if you have to be in a wheelchair, or, you know, if you can't reach high and, you know, and these are all important conversations, Dan. Those are a few of them. <laughs> you know, one of the questions I want to ask, you know, whenever you put yourself out there in the world, especially put, put a book out there like this, not everyone's going to like it. There's going to be the critics. There's going to be some criticism that you receive along the way. But yeah. I wondered, you know, what are some of the criticisms or uh, some of the things that individuals said that, that they didn't like about the book? I first want to start with one wonderful thing that people said that they did like, which is there was a wonderful review at the beginning saying it was like a counseling session in a book. And they really recommended it because it was a way that you and your partner could, you know, read the, the chapters together. And at the end, there's fun work. Um, and well, not, this is uh, applicable for any age group, really, too. And actually, in the foreword, the person who wrote the foreword said he thought it should be given to newlyweds. Not that newlyweds are thinking about retirement, but that these areas, these conversations are important to start having you know, early in your marriage, even before your marriage. Um, and many couples don't do it. And, you know, around finances or around expectations of each other, and it can lead to a lot of disappointments. I think 
you know, part of what we say to people is not all of this is going to apply to you. It's not like you have to read chapter through chapter. Um, some people, you know, feel like it doesn't relate to them. Um, I think um, the issue of sexuality, I think, has been, a, I mean, some people just aren't comfortable with issues around sexuality. Um, in fact, um, you know, when our, we self-published initially and then it was picked up by a publisher, and there were some issues of using the word sex rather than sexuality. So we needed to make some changes to make it comfortable for people from different um, religious backgrounds. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's always hard to have to change parts of your book, but we tried our best to be accommodating. We, you know, we changed it for the most part. Um, but, you know, some people are going to take offense of different parts of it. Um, but in general, there, you know, I mean, maybe there's been criticism, but you know, I'm not as aware <laughs> of a lot of criticism other than, you know, some people, you know, sort of say I dealt with it. It's, you know, it's not helpful. Um, or, and, and some, you know, I, I wish that we went more into legacy. As I give talks now, I'll talk more about legacy. And I'll get more into end of life issues. You know, we, we initially wrote the book in uh, it was self published in 2011, and then it was picked up by a publisher and republished in 2014. And you know, there are different things I would stress now that you know weren't in it. And I try in chapters that I write for other books um, to stress those things, or when I give talks. Um, so. Um, but, I, but I think probably the criticism is um, it, it's just not relevant to what I'm going through right now. Um, I probably should go back and read some of the uh, Amazon comments. Don't, to don't do that. No, <laughs> don't no, do that. It may not help your, your confidence. <laughs> it's going to happen. You're going to have critics, and that's right. perfectly fine. Right. And right. maybe you already answered this, but I mean, you've dialed it down to 10 conversations you should have. I have a feeling you started with well more than 10. Uh, what are, what would you say be one of your one or two uh, conversations that you think you really wish you could have put those in the book and made it 11 or 12 conversations? Well, as I said, I think, I think uh, specifically on legacy and I think specifically on end of life issues and issues. I would, I would have them as separate they're interspersed in other chapters, but I think in hindsight, I would have had them um, separate. We do have at the end a kind of an addendum. You know, what if I started out making plans and it didn't go as I planned, either divorce or widowhood? Um, I might have put a bit more energy, I mean, not energy, but emphasis on having that be part of the conversations rather than more as the, I think we call the detours. Um, but again, you know, it's sort of seeing what the changes have been over time. Um, but I think I would, I think that I would have added more about that. But I think time together, time apart, the expectations, the where to live, the social life. You know, um, yeah, there was a chapter two on, you know, when I say in the best, of, even in the best of relationships, we need other people. We need a sense of community. And, and I'm a strong believer that it's important for people not to be kind of connected at the hip. You know, the healthiest relationships are when both partners, married or not, uh, same sex or not, um, have feel like they're whole separate people. And um, then the coming together is the interdependence rather than you come together and two halves make a whole. It's, you know, it's really good if two people can feel whole. Maybe that speaks to your question about mm. people feeling whole younger. But if two people can feel whole, and then the, you know, the, the relationship is like the icing on the cake, but we've got the cake. You know, each person has the, you know, is the cake. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's great. I love the analogy. You know, I, I can see someone going down the road right now thinking, oh, when I get home, I can't wait to share these conversations with my spouse. Or they want to pick up your book, read through it, and then they want to have these conversations with their spouse. I'm one that I read a lot. I listen to a lot. I go to a lot of conferences, attend a lot of small groups. And when I get home, I just can't wait to have this conversation. That doesn't always go over well. How would you uh, recommend that someone someone start this conversation yeah. or set this up with their spouse it doesn't always go well and i i do say that it you know it's like in a dance one person can take the lead and you can hope the other person follows um, it doesn't always happen but you know i think um i think it's important to you know say i'm thinking about this stage of life more and more and i'd like us to talk about it the, the first part of the book actually focuses on communication. As, as I said, we, you know, we saw these studies coming out saying couples aren't talking. So the whole first part of the book is Communication 101. So we have this acronym called uh, BLAST, and we say have a blast when you're talking. So it's a B-L-A-S-T. So blaming gets in the way. So to the best of your ability, use what are called I statements. I'm thinking about, you know, I've been wondering about, I'm curious about. And try to avoid you statements like you don't, you do, you never. Even if it's not intended, you statements are blaming and shaming. And if you feel blamed and shamed, I know if I feel blamed and shamed, I get defensive, I get reactive. And so if somebody feels blamed and shamed and they get reactive and then you get reactive and we have this dance of being reactive with each other. So blaming gets in the way. Use I state. Listen without interrupting. None of us are born good listeners. In my field, in your field, we have to learn you know, how to actively listen, listen to people. And I think couples need to do that too. You know, it's so easy, particularly if you've been in a relationship for a while, you hear the first few words and it's like, oh, I know where this is going, you know, and you're already thinking about your brilliant response. Now, you might be right, you might know where it's going, but you could be wrong. You really need to check it out. So, you know, it's really helpful to listen. And there's a little technique called mirroring where you can just, before you respond, you can repeat back what you hear and say, this is what I heard you say. Is that accurate? And sometimes you heard the first part and you missed the second part, or maybe you remember the second part and you missed the first part. But we all want to feel heard. And it can really help in conversation. So it's listen without interrupting um, and really actively listen. The A has a number of things. You know, partly it's don't make assumptions. We say assumptions get people into hot water. Agree to disagree. You know, you're not going to agree on everything. But appreciate what you're hearing. And I think that's a really important one. You may agree to disagree, but sometimes a simple question like, just help me understand why that's important to you, you know, can, can really help. I remember at one workshop a long time ago, um, a woman came up to me and said, you know, I never thought to ask that of my husband. And in this little exercise that we had at the workshop, you know, she asked him why something is important. She said, you know, now that I understand why it's important, I want to try to make it happen. You know, so it's, it's, it's simple but important. So the A has a lot of meetings. Agree to disagree. Don't make assumptions. And just appreciate what you're hearing. S is set a time and place to talk. Um, a safe place. So for some people that can be at home, for some in a restaurant or in an outside restaurant nowadays, <laughs> uh, for some in a car. Uh, some people, but if it's going to be heated, it's probably best not to do it in a car. But many people that I've worked with have said that when they're going on a drive, you know, one, the person not driving will read the chapter so the other person listens and then they talk about it. You know, and at the end of the chapter, there's sort of these, you know, fun, um, instead of homework, it's fun work, you know, things to ask each other, things to try to do. And the T is um, 
well, the S also is set a time limit. So S and T kind of go together there. Um, if you're not used to talking together, I recommend don't try to have like an hour long conversation. You know, you can say with an I statement, you know, I've really been thinking about this. I'd like to find time maybe tonight after dinner or during dinner. I'd like just to take maybe 10 minutes to just talk about what I'm thinking about. So set a time limit, because then you know, the beauty of relationships is you can come back to it. So set a time limit, and then the T is talk without distractions. So turn off the phone, turn off the computer. And really try to listen to each other so that you can really be focused on the moment and the conversation. So sort of that's the blast. And in the book, too, there's some parts about how to learn how to do problem solving and how to compromise. Um, the other thing that is mentioned in the book that I see a lot with couples is it's so easy. You may see this in your financial work, too. It's easy for people to get caught in what are called polar positions, my way or your way or win versus lose. And that can be really counterproductive you know, in a relationship or at work or wherever. And so I always say it's helpful if you can kind of open up this little space for the we of the relationship and think win-win. So sometimes it's your way, sometimes it's my way. It's not going to balance out one for one. It just, it never will. But if it's too lopsided, that's when there's anger, resentment, feeling taken advantage of. So try to keep win-win in mind. So those are a few little I love that. Tips. Oh, that's <laughs> so. gold, Dorian. Blast. So a little refresher. Right. Blaming. Uh, don't blame. Say I, not you. Listen. Don't interrupt. And mirror. Uh, ask back. Uh, what, repeat. Receive. Heard. Yeah. Assumptions. Don't make assumptions. Agree to disagree. Appreciate the other individual's position. Set a time, a time limit, mm -hmm. and a place. And talk without distraction. Yeah, those first three, I they're not easy, right? Not easy at all. <laughs> the first right. three aren't easy. Blaming, listening, assumptions. You know, it's so easy for those things to go awry. But I see you add the S and the T, and I can see how that can help overcome the first three. But I feel like what we typically miss, we either get the BLA right, uh, but we forget the ST, or we get the ST right and we forget the BLA. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> So, well, Dorian, thank you so much for that. I wish we had more time. I have uh, more conversations I'd love to have with you. Uh, but first, uh, before we tee up your book, uh, I wanted you to uh, talk a little bit about a webinar that you have coming up. Great. Thank you. Now, starting in May of 2012, I started on the fourth Tuesday of each month at 12 noon Eastern time that I have a free webinar and it's open to professionals and the public. I discovered that I'd been at so many conferences and met so many people, and I really wanted to bring these experts you know, to people who don't often have the opportunity to hear them. Maybe a little bit of a parallel of what you're doing with your podcasts of bringing you know, experts in. And so um, the sign up always is the week before at www.revolutionizedretirement.com. Once you sign up, and as I said, it's free, you'll get the call-in information. It's a telephone call or computer call, um, not video, although that may change um, in the not too distant future. Um, and once you've signed up, you'll get a recording link in case you're not able to be there live. And so it's free, you get the recording link, and it's every month except December because that's just too close to the holidays. And if you go to my website under the kind of the interview or the uh, interview, it's called the Fourth Tuesday Revolutionize Your Retirement Interview with Expert Series to help you create a fulfilling second half of life. And you can, you know, kind of go into it and see what's upcoming. And you can uh, look and see who've been the, um, the people that I've interviewed in the past. And I'm beginning now to come out. I just got the first one just got published a couple of weeks ago. I'm beginning to do some transcri transcriptions from some of the interviews. And the first one, as I said, just came out, I think it's like two weeks ago. And little by little, I don't know that I'm going to do transcriptions for all of the people I've interviewed, but, um, but I edited it and it just comes out as a nice little ebook. 
Um, it's an e-book, but also a little paperback. Um, so there are going to be some transcriptions of some of it. But I would welcome all of your listeners. It's free. You know, tell other people about it. And, um, you know, I, I've just been able, luckily, to just have some wonderful people. In fact, the people I've mentioned, you know, the books, you know, Ken Dykewald, Bruce Feiler, the Life is in the Transitions, they've been my guests, as well as Robert, Robert Laura, who you mentioned at the beginning, and you know, a lot of other people. Oh, so I just welcome your listeners. That. I love that. I love seeing individuals that are putting value out there in the world like you are and expecting nothing in return. That's beautiful. Uh, I wanted to uh, give away your book today. Um, so Dorian has so kindly sent over a box of her books. We're going to give them away until they're all gone. Uh, all you have to do is this, uh, to get a copy of the couple's retirement puzzle, 10 must-have conversations for creating an amazing new life together. All you have to do is write an honest rating and review for the the podcast, subscribe, and then shoot us an email at info at howardbailey.com, info at howardbailey.com with your iTunes username and your address. We'll send you out the book at absolutely no cost. Uh, that's really it. That, it's easy as that. Dorian, thank you so much uh, for sharing all of your wisdom and insights with us here. And I look forward to getting together in person someday in the future. I look forward to that too. And thank you for inviting me. It's Great to be on the program. Thanks, Torben.